there's a lot to be said about how do you form a shish kebab of planets and how do you capture a star, a passing star. So this is going to be a race against time. Uh, the uh, clicker. <laughs> we have... Oh, here it is. Yep. Yep. We have the new uh, less modest... Uh, lectern. The star Proto-Saturn. This is Saturn before it became a gas giant planet in the solar system. <coughs> and this is a quote from uh, Roger Westcott, uh, the late Re Roger Westcott, who was a good friend and uh, used to come to the Cronia conferences and actually spoke at one or two. Prehistory was a dream turned nightmare. Mankind forgot the dream because it was too remote and the nightmare because it was too shocking. The prehistory that we have confabulated, however, is too bland to be believed. He was a professor of anthropology and linguistics at Drew University, Madison, New Jersey. What does the star Proto-Saturn mean? It means a star became the gas giant we now call Saturn. This claim is outrageous according to present-day cosmology and our understanding of stars, but it is supported by lifetimes of forensic research into the earliest recorded memories of mankind, and it is confirmed by the recognition of global prehistoric petroglyphs as representations of the many distinctive forms of plasma instability seen in the highest energy electrical discharges. It has become crystal clear that the legendary thunderbolts of the planetary gods were real and they accompanied a major recent disturbance of the solar system. But perhaps the greatest puzzle for scholars has been the references to Saturn as the first sun. And in my home in Australia, the original inhabitants have legends of a time when there were two suns, a greater and a lesser sun. Details in their dream time stories have no reference points other than in high energy plasma experiments. They were not dreaming. My concern since I became aware of this evidence has been to make classical physics sense of Saturn as a star and to understand the sequence of events that led to the seemingly peaceful solar system we see today. <coughs> so, we have these big questions. Do we really have a 4.6 billion year old clockwork solar system? How do planets form? <coughs> I beg your pardon. How do planets form? How did the atmosphere and ocean form? Was the past like the present? And I think from the evidence that you've seen that Dave Talbot and Ev Cochran have provided, it certainly wasn't anything like the present. So if Saturn was a star within the memory of mankind, it throws some big questions into sharp relief. And in doing so, it throws a harsh light onto our self-satisfying fictional story of the Earth and the solar system. The origin of the solar system. Professor uh, William McRae wrote, it is impossible to discover the origin of the solar system by observing it now and working steadily backwards in time in order to infor infer the whole of its <coughs> past history. The solar nebula model has no successful predictions to its name. And that's a bit of a sobering thought. The, uh, oh, here we go, yeah. My meeting uh, with Dr. Velikovsky, I visited him in 1979 at his home in Princeton, New Jersey. He very gracefully uh, uh, accepted it, uh, my family as well. I've got photos of my daughters with him, but none with me. I was rather shy of <laughs> asking him for a photo. But the main question then was this uh, problem that he faced with astronomers. What don't we know about gravity? There's something really missing in our physics. Velikovsky argued that planets change orbits, exchange thunderbolts, and quickly settle into peaceful orbits. Rapid settling following chaos defies our understanding of gravitational systems, which for more than a two-body system are chaotic, as I said. If one planet departs from its normal orbit by a small amount, it will affect the others and there's no way of restoring the original situation. The system flies apart. Our understanding of gravity and solar system mechanics is inadequate. 
So, we have a new cosmology. A new forensic approach to old evidence produced a recent history of the solar system that requires a critical examination of modern science instead of dogmatic rejection of evidence. The result is an entirely new cosmology, the electric universe. The history of this new cosmological paradigm goes back to worlds in collision in 1950. In the last chapter, Velikovsky referred to Jupiter and Saturn as stars. And I quote, There I wrote with respect to the future that some dark star like Jupiter or Saturn may be in the path of the sun and may be attracted to the system and cause havoc in it. That was in chapter 9, the end. <coughs> Wells in Collision comprises only the last two acts of a cosmic drama, wrote Velikovsky in Kronos, Volume 5, Number 1, in 1979. That's the Kronos issue there. And then we have Dave Talbot's remarkable reconstruction of the earlier acts in our prehistoric skies, and that was published in 1980. Then in Eon, Volume 5, Number 5, in January 2000, I first published my physical model of Earth's relationship to the dark star dubbed Proto-Saturn in Stars in an Electric Universe. It had appeared earlier on my website as Other Stars, Other Worlds, Other Life in December 1999. And then we have all the books uh, by Eduardo Cardona, and they're all there, God Star, published 2006, Metamorphic Star, 2008, Primordial Star, 2009, Flare Star, 2011. So the evidential history is Earth and Mars were satellites orbiting a brown dwarf star. It was a very hospitable environment for life. Atmosphere, water and minerals were deposited on the satellites. The system changed spectacularly on encountering the sun. The brown dwarf flared and ejected a new satellite. An axial column of satellites was formed and intense plasma discharge phenomena were observed. The terms giant and dwarf applied to stars are misleading. They're just calculated on the standard model of the sun. And the notion of a star's age based on its appearance or spectrum has no validity for the same reason. Stars on the main sequence may be characterised as self-regulating cosmic power transformers, as I spoke about this morning that focus diffuse galactic electrical energy to catalyse fusion in their photospheres to provide radiant energy. Like the sun, such stars derive their luminosity from very bright anode tufts in their plasma sheaths. Moving diagonally upward to the right, the current density increases. Anode tufting becomes more crowded and their mutual repulsion forces the photosphere to grow to accommodate them. At the top right of the main sequence, the light from those tufts is electric blue of a true arc, and the stars appear as blue giants, intensely hot objects appearing considerably larger than our sun. As you might expect, blue giants tend to be concentrated on the central axes of our galaxy's spiral arm discharges. Red stars must collect more electrons than the plasma can deliver continuously to its surface. So bright anode tufts are unnecessary. The anode expands instead by forming a negative space charge sheath. And as that sheath expands, its electric field grows stronger. Electrons caught up in the field are accelerated to ever greater energies. And before long, they become energetic enough to excite neutral particles they collide with in the outer sheath to take on a uniform red glow. <coughs> A white dwarf is a star whose discharge current is satisfied by all the approaching electrons. Drift electrons plus those that randomly move towards the anode. It has no anode tufting. It is rather like moving a low energy corona of a main sequence star down into the atmosphere of the white dwarf star. That's why the star, <coughs> the, the dim star, Sirius B, is brighter in X-rays than Sirius A because the corona emits X-rays. So, what is a brown dwarf? To summarise, a red or brown dwarf can be characterised as an independent gas giant type object under low electrical stress from its galactic environment. A main sequence star is electrically stressed, so it resorts to becoming a tufted anode, which, as I said, regulates the output of the star. This is why most all bright stars appear to uh, twinkle um, at they don't change uh, 
from day to day. Red giants are normal stars under low electrical stress. White dwarfs are stars with a low luminosity coronal discharge only. Uh, is that at the same point? Red giant, giants are normal stars under low electrical stress and white dwarfs. So, size matters. Brown dwarfs come with a major drawback for astronomers. Their stellar radii are hard to determine accurately. In the electric universe, brown dwarfs are not dwarf stars. Instead, all red stars have a bloated glowing anode sheath which expands and contracts in order to collect the amount of electrons required for that discharge. As the anode sheath grows, its electric field grows, which results in the prodigious and unexplained stellar winds from cool red giants. If the, if the winds were due to the heat of the corona, then uh, this, this puts paid to that idea. In a December 2008 NASA report, the brightness of a brown dwarf at 17 light years distance was twice that expected for a brown dwarf with its particular temperature. The solution? The object must have twice the surface area, they said. It must be twins. Such ad hocery is unnecessary in the electric universe model. A brown dwarf's photosphere is much larger than the standard model of such stars predicts. The cradle of life. <coughs> and this gets back to the idea of uh, the Garden of Eden period in, um, in man's memory. If you are a satellite orbiting within that anode glow, and this is not an outrageous idea because astronomers have suggested the same thing for red giants, that planets could actually orbit within that uh, star because the atmosphere is such low density. In fact, we orbit in the sun's atmosphere, if you like, and it doesn't uh, cause us any trouble. But within that glowing shell, uh, the radiant energy received from that envelope is constant over the entire globe. The light from the plasma sphere is not reflected light, it's a radiant energy. Brown dwarfs radiate blue and ultraviolet light even though they are cool at a temperature around 950K. This is further evidence that we are looking at a mix of an electrical red anode glow and coronal ultraviolet blue end of the spectrum. There are no seasons, no tropics and no ice caps. A planet does not have to rotate, its axis can point in any direction and its orbit can be eccentric and you'll still get this beautiful even temperature over the whole body. The radiant energy received by the planet will be strongest at the blue and red ends of the spectrum, so photosynthesis, which relies on red light, would uh, be very active. The skylight would be a pale purple, which maybe is referred to by the classical purple dawn of creation. And I know that in Canberra we have this new arboretum, which is fantastic, and all of the new trees that are being planted are put in red plastic to start with and I asked the, uh, the head of the arboretum why they did that and he said the plants grow much better in red light. Water molecules dominate the spectra of brown dwarfs so you want to know where the earth's water came from. The light on earth was dim and purplish amid a continuous mist of water. No other bodies in the system were visible. And this is what uh, Dave mentioned uh, yesterday. This explains the abundant water on Earth and many satellites of the gas giant planets and the rings of Saturn. And the red light, warmth and water was ideally suited for giant ferns. It explains the gigantic lush vegetation found at the poles, fossilised as coal. Now the problem faced by life on planets orbiting a red star, I think you saw last thing last night, which was this flaring red dwarf. So this tendency to flare up is a problem. The reason for this is, that, as I said, the red stars don't have the current regulation afforded by uh, the bright photosphere. So the response of a red star to a sudden electrical disturbance in their environment is to shed charged matter in a flare-up. They may also change in apparent size as the anode glow accommodates to the electrical environment. I think this would account for the great dyings in the geological record and the episodic deposit of vast sediment and mineral layers on the Earth and on other bodies too. Every body that's been looked at is layered. 
What's more, it explains for the first time the oceans of salty water on Earth. Comets cannot be responsible because they have little or no water and little or no sodium chloride. Now, just see how much of this I want to show you because uh, we saw this yesterday. So I might skip. This is re referring to that uh, super flare you saw yesterday. And you remember the uh, astrophysicist said uh, anyone who was on a planet orbiting that star at the time would be having a very bad day. Well, I think the Earth has had, had its bad days and they're reflected in the geological record. So we'll skip that. The mass extinctions, as I said, those flare-ups can be so drastic that it would practically wipe out the life on I any existing life on um, those uh, satellites of that uh, dwarf star. This raises an interesting <coughs> uh, side issue, and that is. Ironically, intelligent life can't communicate through a, such a plasma shell using radio waves. So the lack of intelligible radio signals in the SETI project is understandable. In fact, denizens of such worlds would most likely be unaware of the universe at large. Now, astronomers also submit that orbiting a red dwarf is possibly one of the best places to look for life. What they've never considered is orbiting inside a red dwarf. Uh, let me see. <coughs> I don't think I'll talk about this one. This is a, r a recent report of a spotty brown dwarf which suggests there are things orbiting within that red anode sheath causing uh, a dimming of the glow uh, behind wherever that satellite happens to be. They're calling it weather, but of course if it's an anode glow it has nothing to do with weather. So we'll skip that. So this is a picture of the brown dwarf proto-Saturn as I see it. Now there would have been many more bodies than you see there but I've included Mars and Earth and proto-Saturn because they're the main players at this stage. 50% of red dwarfs have Earth-sized planets in their conventional habitable zone. This suggests there are a large number hidden inside the red star's glow and you can say that too because our gas giants all have large numbers of satellites orbiting quite closely. But you'll note there is no Venus at this stage. <coughs> Gigantism. It wasn't just pterodactyls that struggled to get up off the ground. Scaling of muscle and bone strength shows that dinosaurs could not have raised their bodies off the ground in today's gravity. For them to move about, Earth's gravity needed to be about one third of today's. Global extinction and fossilization requires far more <coughs> pardon me, than a simple impact. Clearly, we have no understanding of the cause of gravity. Is gravity electrical? Gigantism in the animal kingdom. Sorry, beg your pardon. The question is of fundamental importance for cosmology and our understanding of the solar system. And the answer should provide insights into the demise of the dinosaurs, the sky our ancestors saw, and why they feared doomsday. This is the crucial thing. This is the thing I asked Velikovsky. What don't we understand about gravity? <coughs> and of course we're getting confirmation of a sort from this uh, comet visit because all of the measurements say it has very low mass, it can't be rock. And I'm saying, no, you don't understand gravity. It may appear to be of low density, but it's uh, made of rock. This is the kind of thing that the Earth would have been, or the situation for the Earth when it was orbiting proto-Saturn, presumably. So we get to proto-Saturn's capture. Capture by the Sun <coughs> is almost impossible gravitationally because there is no energy loss. There's no way of losing energy. A body coming in and uh, swinging around the Sun will depart again because there's nothing to put the brakes on and make it go around the sun. Electrical capture has a huge cross-section by comparison. Two stars will see them each other electrically once their heliospheres or astrospheres as they're called generically touch. Now the sun's 
heliosphere is 100 astronomical units in radius. Another star would be something comparable. So you're talking about <coughs> a huge cross-section. So the, uh, the chances of capture of an object is far greater than gravity would suggest. Actually, I'll explain more about this uh, when I give my presentation on cosmology, this change in gravity and so on. So proto-Saturn changed from being a star, <coughs> that is an anode in interstellar space, to becoming a cathode or cometary body in the Sun's heliosphere. And like all cathodes, surface material is electrically ejected and the body may fragment under internal electrical stress. And this is the kind of thing which uh, the ancients reported. As you may expect in the electrical model, a brown dwarf desert has been identified close to bright main sequence stars because the brown dwarf switches off and becomes a gas giant. And this is what is seen by astronomers. You won't find brown dwarfs orbiting closely to bright stars. So <coughs> gravitational theory only accommodates accretion disks. Expulsion disks are believed impossible despite the copious evidence of stars ejecting matter in jets. Even the sun does it in a modest uh, coronal mass ejection kind of way. It's also interesting to note the large number of close orbiting gas giants about nearby stars. This fits the electrical fissioning argument and not the nebular accretion model. Gas giants have also been discovered at distances from their stars where they couldn't have formed within the age of the star. All of the impossible planets and stars being discovered are not impossible in the electric universe model. Instead, they are expected based on that model. I'll deal with this issue in my presentation on cosmology. So it explains why there are so many hot Jupiters that have been found closely orbiting a star. It explains the expulsion rings and many satellites of the gas giant planets in our solar system. And the fact that Saturns are the most spectacular indicates that it was the last or most recent uh, uh, gas giant to flare up and eject matter. <coughs> right. Axial tilt families. A simple method of identifying related objects in the solar system is to look at their axial tilts because in the close relationship between a gas giant or a brown dwarf and its close orbiting satellites, there will generally be phase lock. The satellites all have the same face pointing towards the parent. And as these close orbiting satellites therefore will have their rotation axis aligned with the, the parent. Having the same degree of axial tilt, modified by precession after disturbance, like the tearing apart of the Saturnian system, uh, that tilt to the plane of their orbits uh, of the uh, ecliptic should be roughly the same. And we can. Ha this is one way of trying to identify members of the same family, because the Sun has an adopted family. So when you look at the uh, planets here, you've got Mars and you've got Venus and you've got Earth and you've got Saturn, the main players. But Venus is the odd one out. Because research shows with great certainty that it was uh, born from proto-Saturn in a massive flare-up resulting from the initial adjustment to the present Sun's quite different electrical environment. And this is why there are all those radiating streamers, because it was born as a comet from an already cometary body. So the cometary body fissioned and the, uh, <coughs> the resulting ejected body went into, uh, it was still captured by its uh, parent. But it too was busily discharging frantically, trying to adjust to its electrical environment. So all of the radiating streamers and the colossal uh, Venus comet appearances can be explained by this model. Now, when Venus was uh, ejecting material, it occurred equatorial. We were sitting underneath this chain of objects and the uh, streamers were coming out radiating from Venus. And this 
is actually what we see on Venus today. The scars are, are wrapped around the uh, equator. But also, when, you, when these bodies are ejected, the main body may be spinning this way and the material is ejected in a stream. It's given a, a backward kick by its parent. And the result is that the, the satellite initially, <coughs> at least, has a backward rotation. And this is what uh, Venus has, very slow backward rotation. It's had <coughs> it had no time be before the system was totally disrupted to achieve phase lock with proto-Saturn. So we look at Saturn. In June 2004, the Electric Universe was the only model to predict the surface features of smog-shrouded Titan. Titan being a, a huge moon which would be classed as a planet if it was uh, separate from... Saturn. These surface features were uh, predicted before they were revealed in detail by the Huygens probe from the Cassini spacecraft. In Cassini's homecoming I wrote, a scenario follows that is so alien to any conventional theory of Saturn's history that it should be easily tested against information gained from the Cassini mission. It shows striking connections between many seemingly unrelated facts about certain planets. That is something that conventional cosmogony or cosmology has not been able to do. Until recently, Saturn was an independent brown dwarf star with its own entourage of close orbiting small planets. And uh, Dave uh, uh, Talbot alluded to those last night with the circling objects around the god, the god Saturn. The tilt of Saturn at 27 degrees to the ecliptic plane it's, is itself an enigma unless it formed independently from the Sun. And the axial tilts of Saturn, Earth and Mars are very similar. Uh, are we on the same page? No, let me catch up. <coughs> but Titan is very important to study because it may be a sibling of the Earth, Mars and Venus. It's an enigma, having a massive atmosphere, mainly of nitrogen, with a pressure at the surface 1.6 times that of Earth's air at sea level. This is for a smaller body. And anomalously high nitrogen-15 levels in a 95% nitrogen-14 atmosphere. It is not a body more than 4 billion years old. The Electric Universe was the only model to predict the surface features before Huygens uh, descended and photographed it. And that was based on the kind of electrical sculpting seen on Venus, Mars and Earth. The earliest reports from scientists are usually the most revealing before they have time to recover from shock and make up stories. So what was discovered in the first close flyby of Titan? In New Scientist of November 6, 2004, just after the event, Titan images add to Moon's mystery, wrote Stephen Battersby. The world got its first peek at the surface of Saturn's moon Titan last week. The images were taken as Cassini's Cassini Huygens spacecraft swept past the moon. The images show a landscape that is clearly still being shaped. Where did we heard that before? We heard that about Venus. Although Titan must have suffered numerous meteor impacts in the past, its surface today is largely crater free. Once again, just like Venus. Somehow these scars must have been eroded or filled in. There's that operative word somehow. We are seeing a place that is alive, geologically speaking, says Charles Zilaki. Well, this is what they said about Venus. It must have overturned the entire surface recently. That's precisely what was said about Venus when the Magellan Orbiter revealed that, pl that planet's surface. It is only supposition that Titan's surface is still being shaped. It is based on the belief that Titan must have suffered numerous meteor impacts in the past and therefore something must have occurred from within the Moon to fill the craters. However, like Venus, there may have been no impact craters to fill. Some initial comments by Cassini team members accompanying this picture in that little insert there of Titan from the descending Huygens probe reflected on the Venus-like appearance of features on Titan. Now, I'd predicted these before the event. These remind me of what we have observed in the past on Venus. This is a quote. Another quote. We now have the key to understanding what shapes Titan's landscape, said Dr. Martin Tomasco, principal investigator for the descent imager. 
He added, geological evidence for precipitation, erosion, mechanical abrasion and other fluvial activity says that the physical processes shaping Titan are much the same as those shaping Earth. Oh yeah. But non-polar liquid methane is not like liquid water, as Jerry Pollack would tell anyone. In the atmosphere, such molecules form smog, not heavy raindrops. This demonstrates the problem of interpreting evidence when your thinking is limited to flowing liquids to carve channels. The channels on Titan bear the hallmarks of lightning imprinted on the surface. As I've done there, I've uh, inverted the, uh, the black and white and turned it up the other way to make it look more like lightning. The channels on Titan bear the hallmarks of lightning imprinted on the surface. And the lack of a methane ocean was predicted because Titan's atmosphere is not yet in equilibrium after recent events. So a vast reservoir of methane is not needed to make good the losses expected over the 4.7 billion years required by the solar nebula model. Because the expectation was that the Huygens lander, the Huygens probe, would uh, go through the clouds, they'd photograph it on the way down and then it would plop into a methane or ethane ocean. They never found it. Titan's enigmatic atmosphere. Titan's atmosphere is believed by many scientists to be similar to Earth's early atmosphere billions of years ago. Mm. This is the usual story. We're out there to try and show how the Earth was born. Toby Owens, principal scientist at JPL, said, what we've got is a very primitive atmosphere that's been preserved for 4.6 billion years. Titan gives us a chance for cosmic time travel, going back to the very earliest days of Earth when it had a similar atmosphere. All conjecture. But in a sense, Toby Owens may be right. Titan can give us insights about the proto-Saturnian environment, but just take off about five zeros from that age figure. The striking disparity in nitrogen isotopes is telling us something about the way planetary atmospheres are formed rather than how they evolve. Hans Alfain wrote in Evolution of the Solar System, and I quote, The Laplacian concept of a homogeneous gas disk provides the general background for most current speculations. The advent of magnetohydrodynamics about 25 years ago and experimental and theoretical progress in solar and, magnetic and magnetospheric physics have made this concept obsolete but this seems not yet to be fully understood. While acknowledging Alfane's point, it is possible to go a step further and invoke several processes available in the plasma discharge model that would affect, uh, where are we, uh, affect Titan's atmosphere. Was Titan captured or born earlier by proto-Saturn in a major electrical event in its recent history? This is hinted at by Titan's eccentric orbit, which cannot have persisted for billions of years. And isotopes will separate in the combined electric and magnetic fields of a cosmic plasma discharge. So this is where we get into the um, uh, problem of nitrogen in, in uh, planetary atmospheres. Uh, you've got Venus with its heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere. How did these happen? Why are these differences? And it comes down to... Uh, the uh, electrical effects on atmospheric molecules, which I don't think I don't think I discuss here. I just I've done so many <laughs> so many slide preparations. I'm not quite sure which uh, things I've addressed. Oh, here we go. Yes, we come to Venus, Saturn's last born, and a birth witnessed by humanity. The planet shows a surprisingly young surface that gave rise to ad hoc theories of resurfacing events. They're unnecessary. Venus is a baby. The Electric Universe account explains its hellish temperature having been born recently from the interior of a brown dwarf star and its thick 96% carbon dioxide and 4% nitrogen atmosphere uh, was inherited from its uh, brown dwarf parent was subsequently modified by cosmic discharges. The amount of nitrogen in the Venusian atmosphere is relatively small compared to the amount of carbon dioxide, but because the atmosphere is so much thicker than that on Earth, its total nitrogen content is roughly four times higher than the Earth's, even though on Earth nitrogen makes up about 78% of the atmosphere. But Venus may have begun with more nitrogen, more like the Earth. 
Now, nitrogen, and this is uh, understood by uh, astrophysicists, is catalyzed by hot iron atoms to carbon monoxide. The two molecules have very little energy difference. So if you get a, a, a catalytic uh, effect on a hot iron surface, it will convert nitrogen to carbon monoxide. And the carbon monoxide and water on a hot surface gives you carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The hydrogen, being a very light gas, of course, escapes to space, and it's still escaping, it's been shown. The heavier deuterium tends to be left behind, which might explain Venus's ten times higher ratio of deuterium to hydrogen than the Earth. And solar UV light is totally inadequate as an explanation if we accept the short history of Venus. Now, notably, if water is being consumed at the surface and being converted uh, into carbon dioxide with the sick carbon monoxide and the hydrogen is escaping, it's uh, very interesting that water was found to mysteriously decrease as the surface was approached by the Venus landing craft. In other words, that reaction is still taking place today. So, here we see the Venus's equatorial scars were caused by spectacular radial discharging, which was faithfully recorded by the petroglyph artists. The thicker the atmosphere, the more filamentary the surface lightning becomes, as you see. Venus carried away significant charge from its parents so that it still has a cometary magneto tail, which was detected back in the 80s, and its mountains glow with plasma discharges that reflect radar, and this puzzled the uh, scientists greatly. Why are the mountains of Venus shiny when we look at them in radar? Oh, I wrote at the time, it's because they've uh, all got St. Elmo's fire type discharges at above a certain elevation. And that's why just the peaks were glowing in the radar signal. Battle scarred Mars. The devastated face of Mars shows the colossal gash of Valles Marineris stretching a third of the way around the planet. Carl Sagan in the Scientific American of September 1975 wrote, The ultimate objective of comparative planetology, it might be said, is something like a vast computer program into which we insert a few input parameters, perhaps the initial mass, composition and angular momentum of a protoplanet, and the population of neighbouring objects that strike it, and then derive the complete evolution of the planet. <laughs> End of quote. Sagan's statement et epitomizes everything that's wrong with modern science based on computer-generated models of virtual reality. The first law of computing is, and since I was in the computer industry all my working life, garbage in equals garbage out. Planetologists have adopted their story of the Earth, uh, sorry, adapted their story of the Earth to accommodate their findings on Mars. So we now have eras called the Noachian, the Hesperian and the Amazonian based on crater counting. But crater counting assumes the conventional story of formation of the solar system, which as I've shown has no real evidential support. In fact, the evidence is strongly against it. In my next presentation, which is uh, later today, I think, I'll talk about the uh, damage on Mars. But Mars was stripped of atmosphere, water and rocks and the modern evidence, we are still receiving Mars rocks on Earth today. And the evidence of Mars battles with cosmic thunderbolts is written hugely <coughs> on its scar face. That was the name given to Mars by the North American Indians. What can conventional planetologists do with evidence like that? And, of course, we have the MAVEN mission that is going to tell us how Mars' atmosphere was stripped off over four billion years. So whatever that mission was designed to do, the question, the initial question, is irrelevant and wrong. And this is the really interesting thing, is Earth a former Saturnian? And the first question is, why continents and oceans of water? There's no other body in the solar system with continents and oceanic type basins like the Earth. Each planet has its own story of electrical birth and the scars of interplanetary thunderbolts in order to achieve orbital harmony. This is where the battles, these cosmic battles with the thunderbolts of the gods can scar the face of a planet terribly. 
but also the birth process itself can do the same. Electrical sculpting of planetary features is the most powerful concept missing from planetary scientists' toolkit. The Earth's unique oceanic basins with their mid-oceanic raised ridges and orthogonal coronal pattern. If you have a, a powerful discharge, high voltage discharge, you get coronal discharges at right angles to the main discharge channel. And I would suggest that the Earth probably suffered the massive uh, ocean basin carving uh, as a feature of its birth. It was a pole to pole discharge. Mountain ranges with their electrically sculpted ridges and gullies and backbones of intrusive melted rock called granite signify surface and subterranean telluric currents unimagined by geologists. Global tectonics is a failed paradigm because it assumes undisturbed evolution of the Earth in place over millions of years. Brown dwarfs flare and deposit minerals and gases on their satellites. The flare ejects stellar matter from the brown dwarf equatorially or axially most usually equatorially. The composition will vary depending on the depth from which matter is dredged up and the chance encounter between that ejected matter and each satellite. This, I think, explains the water and mineral deposits on Earth, largely. So the rings of Saturn are a water ice remnant of flaring activity. Saturn was the source of the copious amounts of surface water on the Earth and probably the sodium and uh, or the chlorine in particular, because it's hard to get chlorine out of rocks. Each planet has its own birth drama and complex history. This is why the solar system is a complete fruit salad of objects with all sorts of different surfaces and uh, characteristics, axial tilts, rotation rates and so on. They are all individuals, you know. This explains why the Earth, Mars and Venus appear so different even though they may be members of the same family. There is no nebular gradation of physical properties of the planets and the ad hoc suggestion of migration of planets only serves to confuse the issue. All the electric universe does is work with the forensic evidence about the recent most chapter in, uh, most recent chapter in solar system history. So, the future. Professor Westcott is right. Mankind's survival is astonishing. Of course, there are reports globally of dreadful heat and cold while the Earth established its new home in the solar system. This is to be expected on a cometary orbit. It seems to me that part of the answer for our survival lay in the great heat reservoirs of the oceans. But there was also the exchange of electrical energy via the cometary discharge, which may have provided some additional heat while circularizing the orbit of the Earth, as I'll discuss later. But as Roger Westcott makes clear, we may have no future if we do not understand our irrational behaviour, trying to imitate the power of the old gods in our ability to, dest to destroy each other and the environment. Velikovsky, as a psychoanalyst, felt his most important legacy, as he makes clear in Mankind in Amnesia, was to help us understand our cat catastrophic past and by so doing, begin to heal from those psychic wounds. Fear is a great cattle prod, but we are not cattle. Thank you.